Let's talk about this thing. Um, I built this in a video series a while back. Um, and the goal is to build a functioning cathode ray oscilloscope that is fairly simple. Um, but still has some features. Um, and it is supposed to be all vacuum tube based. And I succeeded to a point. I mean, um, it gives us a dot on the screen and we can move it around. And the next step would be to build um, 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 a trigger circuit. And that is what held me back for quite a while. Um, because building a trigger circuit isn't all that easy, as it turns out. Um, but uh, then I got my hand on a couple of these small firetrons and found that these can be used to build a very, very simple trigger circuit. Um, and since this is bandwidth um, why is not going to go uh, above a couple of kilohertz. I think 20 kilohertz is a, is a good goal. Um, these are actually fairly well um, suited to the job. But if I look at this project, there's a couple things um, that, well, not annoy me about it, but there's a couple things I don't like. First of all, when I started, I didn't have a socket for the tube. Um, I actually bought a second um, cathode ray oscilloscope tube um, in the meantime, and I did that because uh, I didn't want to uh, ruin my one good tube in testing and then have to abandon the project. So this is a, a fairly worn down tube, but I'll have this and I'll test with this, and once it runs fine on this tube, then I'll swap in my brand new nice uh, B7S3. So, but the used tube, it actually came with a socket, so um, I think it is high time that I change this raggedy wiring here. This is actually, these are actually um, pins uh, that are pulled out of an octal tube socket. Um, well, it's, it's alright, but it's a little wobbly, and then there's fairly dangerous voltages on here, so if you brush against it, you'll electrocute yourself which is not great um, and then the second um, big thing is the power supply is basically just a, a doubler circuit here with uh, two diodes but it's fed by this enormous um, transformer that puts out 600 volts at about an amp or two which first of all I don't want to use that transformer for this oscilloscope because it's way too large and it's uh, I'd rather put it in another project um, and second of all I don't want to use this for testing because if you touch this you'll die um, simple as that I mean if you touch the output here while it's running this is is a fail, fairly dangerous transformer um, and this is an intricate enough project that it will require a little uh, testing so not ideal um, it, I mean, the da danger, it can be handled absolutely uh, fine, there's uh, no doubt about it, uh, I, but I'd rather minimize the risk and use um, a smaller transformer um, that will um, suffice, because this is a 500-watt transformer, yeah, 500-odd-watt five, this oscilloscope is maybe going to be um, 50, 50, 100 watts, maybe, maximum. And that's uh, that's all power, um, in, including the, well, maybe including the heaters, it's going to be about 200 watts. But the heaters I'm going to get directly from the, from the mains. So um, this is way overkill. And then also, this doesn't have any filament... Uh, uh, taps on it, so I have to put a second transformer here um, to supply the filament of the picture tube because this um, doesn't run at the 300 milliamps all the rest of the tubes run at. So that is quite annoying. And then the last thing that um, I don't like about this is the base here. 
this is this very cheap um, particle board and I'd rather have it on some nicer wood although this is um, not my highest concern right now so I think it's time we do um, a little redesigning and while we're at it I might even change the um, way this is um, built from um, basically point to point wiring which is what it is at the moment um, where the components are just tacked onto these tube sockets to um, printed circuit board um, although I'm not entirely sure that I want to do that right now um, especially for the power supply because the power supply doesn't have uh, a lot of components on it so um, something like this is just fine if you have four components uh, under here um, it gets a little more um, shall we say challenging um, if you have a lot of um, components or you have a multi-system uh, vacuum tube so um, that is all of that also I want to change this um, capacitor up here this is a fairly large capacitor um, to this smaller capacitor these are I mean I have a couple of these now so um, these are both uh, rated for um, across the line use um, and they're both um, safety capacitors, but this one is intended for uh, fluorescent lamps. And so it's a little awkward to mount because this is supposed to um, this is supposed to go into a lamp housing and not a circuit board or anything like that. So um, I can eventually get that out of here. No, I can't. <laughs> this is screwed in. So it has a little stud on it, and it's screwed into a metal base plate down here. Yeah, you can see that in the previous video. Um, but, yeah, I, this would work, and this would be fine, but I don't like the way this is built. And also, um, now that I've... Let's see critiqued every single component on this. Um, this capacitor array down here is a little dangerous in itself. Um, I also don't like that much because the tops of these capacitors here um, are connected to the cathode and since this is a multiplier stage the cathode of these capacitors are um, charged to, if you, if you uh, hit the middle ones, are charged to about 500 volts. So you don't want to do that. Um, that's why there's captain tape on there, so you can't do that, but I'd still like a little more of a professional solution to that. So, I think it's time for a major overhaul on this, and then we can think about the uh, triggering circuit, and then we'll probably top it off with a vertical and horizontal amplifier, and um, then we'll, we'll be done um, if everything works. But first of all, uh, subject of this video... Um, we're going to redesign most of this and if we get that done um, quickly then I might even lose a couple of words about uh, what I want to do with the triggering circuit. So as you can easily see um, I took everything off the old um, board and I mounted the tube to a new um, larger wooden board which is also a lot nicer um, what I did is I offset it way over to the left um, so that I have a large space here to put all my components this is also quite a bit larger than the old one um, just because it was getting a little crowded um, the, the smaller board that I used before this is um, so this is the first step and then for the power supply, instead of the ginormous uh, 700 volt transformer, what I think I'll use is a small radio transformer like this. Um, which is nice because of two things. First of all, this comes with a 6.3 volt heater winding, so I don't need an additional transformer. I can just heat the tube directly from that. 
And the rest of the two Peters will either be fed from this or more likely will be fed directly from the mains. Um, the rectifiers I'll definitely fe feed directly from the mains. Um, and the next thing is, this is quite a lot lower current. Um, this is rated for about 100 milliamps at 200 volts. Um, which first makes this unsuitable for this, but um, if we use a tripler and basically triple the voltage, um, we can get down to, let's say, 30 milliamps, 20 milliamps at um, about 1,000 volts DC. This is 230 volts-ish open circuit AC, so um, which is way more than we need. And um, therefore, this is a little safer because um, we have about 10 times less current. And also, this comes out at 200 volts, while the other one came out at 600 volts, um, which is a bit of a difference. Um, also, besides the, uh, these reasons, I'm fairly comfortable handling these transformers. I repair radios all the time, and... Um, I know pretty much what to expect uh, from these. The The thing is, um, this does not have... This um, originally had a fuse holder here, but this has broken off since then. I wouldn't trust that anyway. So I'll add another fuse holder. And um, next thing is we'll redesign the power supply a little bit um, to make it work with this transformer. I also have... This is another reason for the redesign. I also have a couple new um, requirements for the power supply since I think I want to go from single-ended driving of these plates um, to differential driving because I was getting issues with um, getting the beam all across the screen. So um, I think differential driving is probably the way to do to go with, with this tube. Unfortunately, I don't have a proper data sheet for this. All I have is um, what they call factory specifications, which basically tells you all the all the tolerances of the tube and also some voltages that you need to drive this. But it tells you nothing about how you would actually um, drive this. For example, I, it doesn't tell you how to drive, drive these at all. Or um, It just tells you the... Um, the maximum voltage for the anode is a kilovolt. And then it doesn't tell you anything about what it actually should be, like a recommended voltage. It just tell, tells you don't go over one kilovolt. So this is a little bit of trial and error, and I found with single-ended driving, um, I'm getting issues. So um, I'll try that. Uh, I'll try differential. Uh, another thing is, um, it might also have been due to the power supply because I had only 80 volts, plus minus 80 volts to drive these. Maybe this is um, this is not enough. Maybe you need 150 or so to, to get the dot all across the screen, um, which we can easily do once we build this new power supply. So the next thing I did here is just basically to mount a transformer um, and connect up the heater winding. Um, I also connected all of the... Con uh, all of the connections from the vacuum tube um, down to this strip so I have easy access without um, having to solder something on the socket here um, which I also connected up um, or to uh, run additional wires from the, from the tube I can just um, hook up everything that needs to be connected to the tube to just um, this turret board here the only thing that I didn't connect is the anode cap here um, because I don't want to have the high voltage on an open strip of turret board here. So I think the next thing we should do is design a power supply that um, connects to these two leads. Then also make a fuse block um, and a line in for this. So the next thing I did was um, make up this multiplier here. Um, which is different from the multiplier on the last oscilloscope in that is actually a quadrupler instead of a doubler because um, we have only 230 volts instead of 600 coming in. Um, I'm using 
uh, quadruple. And <clears throat> internally, this is uh, built up as two doubler cells of opposing polarity. And that way you get a little less ripple. And we'll look at the schematic in a second. The capacitors for this are put on a PCB over here. These are um, bolted down. And I also put a secondary fuse here. So that um, if there's a sh short circuit somewhere here, um, this will actually blow this fuse instead of the transformer. Um, and an additional thing I did, because I was really bothered by the uh, tops of the capacitors, which are in a serious string like this, are actually charged to a dangerously high voltage. I printed these little caps. And these are actually um, about a millimeter thick. I'll just focus on them here. These are about a millimeter thick, um, maybe one and a half, um, but they go down to 0.5 of a millimeter um, in this in this cutout here. And the idea is you basically put this over the vent. Um, these happen to have these um, uh, these style events here um, with the four slots. Instead of the, I think, more traditional three. Um, so, won't focus properly. But anyway, so this is these are just glued on, um, and I don't think they will um, really inhibit the venting of this if something should go bad, um, because the plastic is really quite thin compared with the aluminium and. Um, if this cap bulges, then it will basically lift this off, and then it will vent probably underneath, or it will break this cutout here. But um, the risk of this exploding is definitely... The, I mean, the higher risk of this exploding now is definitely um, justified against the risk of touching the top and getting an electric shock, which is quite um, painful. So... Um, this resistor here, um, this also has a little leader resistor down here, which you probably can't see properly. Um, but it also has this resistor here, which I just used to um, test the output of this. And I can draw about 10 milliamps from this um, without any issues, um, with minimal voltage drop, actually. Voltage drops about 50, 50 volts, which is great. So another thing, you see, there is um, six capacitors here, and you would only need four for a double, uh, for a quadruple. Actually, you need four diodes, four capacitors. What I did is um, these two pairs. No, actually, these two pairs of capacitors here. Those are in series to uh, bump up the um, the the rated voltage because. Um, these are 450 volt caps, and um, the voltage on these is going to go up to about eight, um, about 600 on on each on each capacitor in the circuit. So I put two 450 in, so we get about 900, which is plenty. But this is not so on the first stage. On the first stage, these charge up to about 300 volts. Um, and so I've just put a single capacitor each. Um, and since this is all the same 47 microfarad, 450 volt cap, um, also the capacitors on the second stage are now half as large. They're uh, 23.5 um, microfarads. But this is all right um, since um, the output impedance is fairly low still. Um, I actually think I calculated it, but I can't remember the value. It was um, around a couple tens of K, I think, for the whole device. Um, so let's just quickly look at the circuit, which is um, an example circuit straight of Wikipedia. Um, so these two are the first stage capacitors. Then here's the diodes, the four... Uh, Vacuum tubes, which here it's solid state diodes, but it doesn't matter. Yeah? 
And then this is the basically two capacitors in series here. Um, and these shows non-polar capacitors. What you have to um, think about is that you, if you use electrolytics, you put the positive towards this rail um, because this is the negative side here. And then you get from a 230 volt input, you get uh, 230 times square root of 2 times 4, which is about 1200 volts, which is perfectly fine. Um, we need about a thousand to run this tube, and then we need another rail at about 500 um, to run basically the um, acceleration grid, the post cathode acceleration. This has actually, um, this is internally um, basically a pentode with um, the two sets of deflection electrodes. So this. Um, actually has another grid that um, sits right around here down there after the, the cathode which is back here and it basically accelerates the um, electrons and then they are deflected and then you get more acceleration as they reach the anode which is uh, then more positively charged uh, and this is a very common thing with uh, larger tubes. I think this is not that large, but um, it's, I think, the one of the smallest tubes that actually merits doing that. But um, if you have a smaller tube, it will very likely not have that. It will be basically a, a triode internally, um, which um, will only have an anode connection and basically a grid and the cathode and then the deflection electrodes inside. Or if it's magnetically uh, focused, then it won't even have that. So, yeah, that's basically that. Um, the next thing I want to do is basically um, build something similar to this, which we used on the previous version. And um, But the, the chain, this is a, basically a resistive divider that just uh, gives us a couple of voltages. Um that we need to run this tube, so the 1000 and the 500, and then um, the voltages for the actual deflection plates, and that sort of thing, and the cathode voltage, and all of that. But the problem with this is, um, this is non-stabilized at all. This is just a, um, just a resistive ladder. And what I want to do, because I got some problems with instabilities on the last one, is basically have... A regulator that regulates it down the voltage out of here down to about a thousand volts and then have a resistive ladder because if the input is stabilized um, then all these subsequent voltages in the string will also be fairly stable um, obviously uh, this doesn't compensate for the resistors having different uh, characteristics and heating up and so but this is not this is not going to give you that much trouble. So uh, I think it's a good idea to actually build um, a resistive divider that is fed by a linear regulator, two-base linear regulator. And since this only has to drop about 300 volts at the very maximum, um, I think I might use this tube. I mean, not this exact tube. This is obviously a breadboard sort of thing. But... Um, this is a 6S19P, um, it says on here. And um, this is designed as a, a triode for linear regulators, and it can stand, according to a data sheet, it can stand about 550 volts and dissipate 7 watts, which is great. That's uh, perfectly fine. That's perfectly uh, within the scope of this project. Um, but then I've seen reference design that use this exact, this exact tube that drop a thousand volts or so over this tube, and they seem to be fine. Um, this is not going to happen here, but it's good to see that we have some headroom, um, and that we, if we really wanted to, we could, um, regulate it down a little further. So I think I want to, uh, put all of that on a PCB. Because um, if I use 
uh, print socket. This is stand up about this this much. And if it's the only tube in the stack, that won't radiate as much heat down there. Uh, basically, why I why I use the chassis mount thing here is because these tubes get really hot, um, and they're fairly concentrated here, um, which might give us some problems later. But I don't think so. Um, so I used a steel chassis basically, and I hope they won't radiate uh, enough heat to actually melt this plastic here. Uh, but we'll have to see if that actually happens. This is um, ABS anyway, so it should be a little um, more resistant to heat than uh, PLA. Yeah. So um, next thing uh, is design a linear regulator with this tube on it that gives us all the voltages we need. And what I'll also incorporate, I talked about this before, because I want to go to symmetrical uh, drive of these plates, um, I'll, give, I'll give myself some more room. The previous version had 80 volts to drive, to drive the plates each, and I think this time I want maybe 200 either side of the 500 volts of grid 2. So even if I if I drop some voltage on the way to uh, actually getting the differential signal here, um, I can still get all the way across this screen. So yeah, that's the next thing I'll do. And um, then we'll see uh, how that works out. And after that, we'll build the, basically the, the deflection circuit. And then we'll build our trigger and sync. And then, at the very last, after I know how many tubes are in series, then we'll build a heater supply. And then we should be done. This is a, a project that's taken me a while. Um, but it's really not that easy finding um, the references to, to these designs in, in vacuum tube uh, circuits. Because everybody these days is obviously doing transistors. Even when they're doing a retro-ish scope with an old tube like this, they'll probably go, oh yeah, I'll do it in seven transistors, and they'll have an elaborate transistor circuit to do this. But uh, nobody does, does vacuum tubes in, in these sort of things. But that's what makes it interesting. Um, but yeah, it, it takes time to actually get this all together. So next thing I did after building uh, this voltage multiplier here is to basically make up a board. Um, with the regulator on it and um, I did go a little overboard with this but um, this uses basically a glow discharge tube error amplifier EF80 and then a, um, what is this a 6S 6S19P um, linear regulator triode and then, same as on the last build, um, it has a resistor divider down here that gives us all our voltages. And we'll look at a schematic in a second. Um, also, I put a potentiometer down here with which you can adjust the output voltage of the regulator, um, which is nice. At the moment, the output of the voltage regulator it goes up to about 950 volts um, because this has a minimum drop of about 200 volts and fully loaded. This only goes to about uh, 1,200. It drops by about 50. So um, right on the edge of what this regulate, basically what this uh, setup can do. But um, should the need arise to actually raise this voltage slightly, um, I have enough GIF in the voltage ratings here um, that I could set this transformer this is, at the moment, this has a, an input voltage selector on here. And uh, my local voltage is about 235. Um, so this has a voltage selector on it, and it's set for 240. But it also has one that's uh, 220. So I could go down to uh, 220, and then I'll get another, I don't know, 50 volts, 100 volts out of this uh, multiplier. And then I'll definitely get up a higher voltage at the output if I should need that for the tube, which I don't anticipate. Um, so let's turn this on and let's measure some voltages. I'll clip the um, the ground here to the cathode. And our target voltages are as follows. 
it's a thousand volts up here this for the um, for the anode then 750 for the high point of the differential driver then 500 for uh, grid 2 and grid 4 then 250 for the low point of the differential driver and now this is obviously turning itself off um, and then we have 90 for the acceleration grid grid 3 then we've got zero for the cathode, and then we've got minus 40 to zero for the um, for grid one. And grid one and grid three are actually connected to these potential. Um, so you can actually um, adjust the voltages because um, grid one, this is this pod, uh, corresponds to intensity, and grid three. Um, corresponds to um, focus I think um, so these should be user adjustable this one is hidden inside the, the chassis because um, the overall output voltage is not user adjustable well it's not adjustable in use you could obviously go in and adjust it but you I don't expect that you have to so I'll turn the whole thing on And you'll see the tube is already connected, it's lighting up here. Um, and so do these. Um, these are, this whole board is, by the way, it's driven from the 6.3. Because I have some, some room there. Um, and loading the 6.3 down at startup means um, the tube isn't uh, punished quite as heavily. Um, because this, the 6.3 volt voltage winding is spec out to drive about uh, five or six tubes and if you only have one uh, tube connected that will um, you'll have a far quicker heat up time and that's not necessarily all that good for the tube so um, also it's a very convenient way to to drive this um, we'll see if I do the um, the horizontal vertical amplifier into sync circuit. If I also run that from 6.3, then we'd have the um, series string tubes located just here. Should also be nice um, because I don't have to run the line voltage through there. But we'll see. So I'll connect this here to the anode. Oh, you see, we're already up at 300 volts as these are heating up. Uh, these are heating up very slowly at the moment because this capacitor is a little too small. Um, but I'll definitely use a different capacitor once um, um, I know how many uh, tubes I've got to drive in this series string. As you can see, the voltage regulator is already lit up. Um, what you can't see, because you're looking top down, is that these tubes are also glowing fairly brightly. Um, so we're up to... 920-ish. So from there on it's going to rise fairly slowly. And I think that's about the maximum we'll, we will get. Which should still be fine driving the uh, cathode uh, Ray tube. So 940 would be our anode voltage. We should have a thousand here, so it's 60 volt off, but that's fine. Should have 750 here, which is 700, okay. Then we should have 500 here, it's 468. But the important thing is this should be about half of the anode voltage, which it is. And then here we should have 250, which is 230. Then here we have 128, 126. So I'll just see if I can adjust this down with the potentiometer. To, yeah, where it should be. And 90. But this um, you'd have to adjust in, in use, just uh, so you get the best beam. On the last build, I had this up 
uh, fairly high. This was up at 130 and that gave me pretty good focus. So the cathode obviously is zero because we've got our lead connected there. We go down here. We've got it at minus 26 at the moment. And we can go up to zero or we could go down to minus 60, which will give us complete cutoff. So we should have a fine intensity control too. So let's go to the schematic and um, look at that. So let's look at our schematic here. Um, this is basically the same sort of regulator I put into two other projects. Um, uh, I think the second video I uploaded to this channel um, details this regulator, but for a, a phono amplifier. But the principle is the same here. Um, the tubes are just a little different and the values are a little different. But you can find, um, if you search for uh, vacuum tube linear regulator circuit, you'll definitely find uh, something like this. And you can go from there. So what this basically is, it, the 6S19P here as a linear regulator, high tension comes in here. Um, and then the output is this. So this goes out to our resistor. And then um, we um, basically go down here and have an error amplifier tube that has its cathode elevated by this uh, regulator here, which is at 8510, and um, the potentiometer circuit here, um, which basically sets the output voltage. And um, if you want a fury of operation, you'll find that on the internet. Um, or if anybody really wants that, I could make a video about how this works. But um, this is uh, mostly about um, the end results, not about the fury of operations of the circuit. So this is um, yeah, this is just a basic linear regulator circuit here. Um, Resistor ladder, same as the last time, um, although with uh, far lower values, so um, I can draw more current because I want to have a bit of headroom for the, um, for the differential driving here. So this is our first 1000 volt, then a 50k um, to get a 750, another 50k to get a 500, another 50k to get a 250. And then um, the 10k potentiometer for the grid-free accelerating voltage. What I didn't um, put on the circuit board, unfortunately, is two 15k resistor, resistors that I need here. So these are soldered directly to the potentiometer and then go into these, um, these pads here. Um, here I left room for some resistors that I just jump it because I don't really need them. Um, because I initially wanted to do this a little differently, but um, this is how I did it. And then another 10k pot for the cathode. And that's basically it. The, the EF80 and the 6S19P are both in parallel and driven from the transformer. Um, this, as said, is the input from um, the voltage multiplier. And then we've also got a ground connection, and that's all. Um, one thing that is actually interesting here is if you're laying out this on a circuit board, um, you have to play, you have to pay close attention to um, your clearance settings, because um, you need about a 200 mil or I think five millimeters uh, of clearance for um, the regulated output voltage to ground, um, or even more for the for the unregulated. So what I did is I set my clearance to about 100 mil, which is two and a half millimeters. And then I just routed it in a way that I always had traces for um, things with less than 500 volts difference um, next to each other. So I, for example, route the, um, the regulated um, high voltage next to, I don't know, the, the 750 line. Or I'd route um, this next to 
um, the the output here then it's 200 volt difference that's fine then I drag this this and then um, arrange it in a way that you can get away with using the lower clearance because um, what you have is just um, lines with lower potential difference between each other and so you can basically make room and go down so you can have your your ground on next to the I don't know to the cathode or something which uh, and then you can get away with um, not having five millimeters of clearance between all of these because then your your circuit board would have to be huge um, yeah so that's basically that so the only thing left to do um, now for I think this rebuilding of the circuit is um, to actually hook it up and see if it works. So the last thing that I um, had to do to get um, back to where we were um, before I started this rebuilding process is um, basically hook everything up to the power supply. So I've got the minus voltage hooked up to the cathode, um, cathode hooked up to zero, then the variable rate free acceleration voltage hooked up to this. Um, word of note here, um, to get this really sharp, this potentiometer is almost uh, at its full range. So um, I'll probably change these resistors here um, around a bit so I get a little higher acceleration voltage. Um, the data sheet that I have says about 90 volts, but in all my experiments, um, I found that um, about 110 is good, 110 to 120, which is still very much within spec, um, but it just needs a little more. Maybe because this tube is kind of tired, that's um, very much possible. Maybe it will get uh, much sharper with the newer tube, um, but yeah. Yeah, and then um, the grid 2, grid 4, and the anode. These two pins here, these are where uh, I'll connect the differential driver for the plates in here. Um, and this will be the subject of the next video in this series, we'll be building the differential driver. Um, and for that, I already have a prototype here, off camera. Um, this is basically what we're going to use, is just a single uh, ECC81 double triode and a um, couple resistors and capacitors um, to make basically a differential driver. And then um, we've got to think about the position controls um, because it's not as easy as it was before where we just connect one of these plates to a potentiometer with varying resistance and the other one to the actual driver circuit, but we need to somehow inject a voltage here to um, bias this uh, one way or the other. But we'll talk about that in the next video.